So what a nice weather, huh? <laughs> <laughs> if there's no topic like an elevator, or there's some topics you should not talk about, it's uh, politics or uh, sports, so always talk about the weather. So this is something everybody has in common. So uh, lovely weather. So we didn't have this last, yeah, yesterday. I was uh, flying from Frankfurt out like in the afternoon. It was a severe thunderstorm, so I skipped like two flights. At the end, I end up like at 8 p.m. flying in. And we had bad weather, still today rainy, but now it's like amazing. So um, we keep this short to go out there. Um, hello, my name is Achim Kahle. I'm uh, from Urex. Um, I'm the responsible sales uh, in the Nordic area. And so likewise with Nico, we work for Deutsche Börse Group. So Urex, as well as Stocks, is a daughter of like the Deutsche Börse Group. Um, since uh, last year, I'm responsible sales captain for this uh, ESG derivatives, and uh, I come up um, front um, of those lovely, handsome guys here. So um, I'm start with uh, how we get, end up in derivatives. So um, after me, um, Willem will follow, and then uh, Tobias will follow, and then last but not least, uh, Magnus. And I think with different type of presentation, we have uh, UX Docs, uh, and uh, is it IMC? And, <laughs> and of course, Ruber. So uh, first slide. Um, do you know who's this? Just hands up. Okay, who don't know who's this? Hands up, hands up. I cannot see the hands. There's few people who don't know her, right? Okay, uh, actually, uh, then you should be uh, better watching because uh, Stefan actually uh, this morning come up with this one. So uh, this is uh, Greta Thunberg. Uh, she is um, actually like, uh, she started this movement in uh, Stockholm, Sweden, right? Uh, last year, August, um, she's the one who decided to uh, jump on the street to quit school uh, for her future. So uh, she started this movement, uh, School Strike or Fridays for Future. It's all over Europe now. Uh, we have like different movements. It's really, really impacting. It's not just that impacting like, uh, like on the streets and the kids that they are not going to school. It's also like impacting politicians like uh, European-wide or I would I say uh, worldwide. I can say worldwide. Um, Actually, uh, some facts, um, uh, she, she uh, has to aim to reduce like, the carbon emissions in Sweden around 15%. And another uh, fact is that she's actually a descendant of um, Svante Arrhenius, so it's like, a, I guess, a Swedish name. Uh, he's a Nobel Prize winner. He determined this uh, carbon emission thing, like uh, changing climate emission carbon dioxide, uh, which is very interesting. Um, and it's a movement she started on her own, uh, and, and it's got a really, really big impact, so it's uh, worldwide. So uh, what's, what's the movement about is like a system uh, change, uh, so it's really a big one. So, um, and it's really, uh, what she always says is like the house is on fire, so act now. We should really be fast. So this actually, um, what I'm talking about is the reason why we came up with this ESG um, derivatives and with ESG like indexes from stocks. Um, and what did we do last year? So last year we started together with uh, Nico and also with my colleague Christine Heide, she's there in the audience as well from UX product uh, development, uh, to do a consultation round in the Nordics. And we went, or not just Nordics, like all Europe-wise, we went to our major clients, um, um, mostly bicycle lines. And um, it was actually the last point on the last panel. So is there like, um, is there like a standardization coming for ESG? Or do we have like any standards on ESG? So we wanted to figure out what is the, the broadest like common sense on ESG. And at the end, we figured out there is no broadest common sense. So the thing is, uh, let's keep, uh, let's take an uh, example given like nuke power. For, for Germany, like nuke power is totally like a waste and it's like totally bad for the environment. We should really stop using nuke power. Uh, if you take a look at France, it's a part of solution. So nuke power actually is, there's no, carbon emissions out of new power. Of course, no carbon emissions, but what else is left? So we have to think about it. So it's really hard to get a, a common understanding of uh, ESG and what, what does standardizing mean. Um, so um, if we think about this one, climate change, uh, it's, it's more, everybody can see it. I mean, just think about last summer, what kind of a heat it was. Like in Sweden, it was like the hottest summer ever. They had like uh, forests were burning and uh, it was just crazy about the summer and I think right now this year started also pretty pretty uh, crazy with the temperatures so there is a change coming and um, but ESG is not just about climate uh, it's more about all of it and um, um, if we thought about like a common thing to come up at the end we we had another thing what was really like uh, big 
and this was the controversial Batman theme. So there actually was, um, a, it's called Swiss Sustainable Finance Group, a, a group of, uh, it started with a 141 asset manager in January of thir uh, 31st. Uh, they wrote a letter to all index provider and actually asked, hey, you should exclude all controversial weapons. And why do you have them at all in the index? Um, so uh, last signing, it was like um, now 166, about 9 <coughs> trillion uh, US dollar on assets under management, the asset under management were like requesting those, those figures. So, um, okay, this was something uh, what we really had to take into account. Um, and the next thing was, uh, when we want to build up something on, on the derivative side, uh, it was always like the key factor for success was called liquidity. Um, as we are from, from Eurex, uh, liquidity, key factor for success, we just take a look on our benchmarks. Of course, we have the Eurostox 50 future, which is like the most popular derivatives like in Europe traded at all. And uh, there's like a, a little, or I should say big brother, it's the Eurostox, uh, Stocks Europe 600 index, uh, which is actually like the top uh, 600 blue chip um, in Europe. And what we can see, if you just take a look on the development there, we can see um, more and more shifting um, um, uh, volume from stocks 50 into 600. Yeah, because 600 is more diverse. Uh, it's more ex also exposure to the south of Europe. And um, yes, if you want to ally uh, ESG methodology with exclusion, it uh, totally makes sense to do exclusion on this one first to see what's the outcome. So this was really like uh, one, one of our key measures, what we heard, and liquidity is not just given like easy by just getting a liquid benchmark on the road and then uh, apply ESG. No, we no need also like support for this one. And um, the support, uh, what we saw is, um, um, or what we got from the market makers and also sell side banks was really immense, was really good. And I will show a list later on this. Um, so, we decided to uh, start with this one up. And what is this one about? So where, where, where did we put like our, our ESG uh, futures or alignments uh, on ESG in place? So all around you see the Stocks Europe 600 to the pan-European uh, um, benchmark futures. Uh, beneath they have the Euro stocks, so the Euro nominated futures. And you see the Euro stocks 50 there. And if you talk about liquidity, so those products were traded like 410 million times last year. And if you just take the figure like notional volume on the stocks 50, so we had more than 10,000 billion uh, notional traded volume there in this one. So we, we came up with this solution to adopt like ESG relevant uh, uh, futures there. Um, another effect was, as I said, we uh, were searching for liquidity providers and it was kind of easy to get those liquidity providers on board because first of all, we used a known benchmark. So we used the US stocks 50 and the stock 600. So these are like uh, benchmarks the market maker knows. They are already like uh, active in this one and it was really keen to it. Uh, e really easy to adopt for them. Uh, we have like, from the beginning, we had uh, five market makers there. Uh, just recently joined the last one, Optiver, which is very um, uh, prospecting. And of course, we have a market makers uh, off book there. So this was like the key uh, factor for success on what we can see now on the development. So as of um, 13th of April, we almost uh, reached like in open interest on notional volume, a uh, half a billion euro, like open interest. So this is really like located assets which are resting there, like uh, placed in this uh, uh, future space, like the new ones, which I have to admit, the ESGX is the most like traded or the one who drives the volume so far, besides the low carbon. But on the index and, and how the methodology works, um, Willem will tell you soon more. What we figured out in our client consultation is that uh, the interest on ESG is uh, getting bigger and bigger. So we did the consultation. I just want to give you one example. So we went to a big insurance company in Germany and we talked to those guys. Um, and then they explained, uh, like the others, uh, how they adopt ESG and what kind of criteria they use. And this is also like, are the criteria standardized? I would say, yeah, we can standardize, but I don't think it will be. Because if you just take a look on the US continent and look, take a look on Europe, we have like different uh, like industries going on. We have like different drivers for the economy. And just example given, so we asked the insurance uh, company, hey, but do you, uh, you use your like this, this appliance, this criteria is also like in US, so do your asset management and use these criteria? And they said, uh, yeah, we try to, but uh, as we mentioned this one, as we said, um, 
hey, we want to do this and that, so we apply this criteria, let's say controversial weapons, uh, they get like um, a nice sounds from, from political side driven, so, uh, and they get told, hey, if you do this, like you exclude this and that company, you will be uh, whatever branded like a non-patriotic company, so exactly this is something that the force from politics uh, can come in, and then of course, yeah, they, they thought about it. Um, yeah, that's the success story so far. Um, at the low carbon and the climate impacts, uh, Willem will tell you more, like now. Uh, we will see, I think, development as soon as regulation kicks in, as soon there will be carbon tax applied. And I think uh, Willem will give you details also like in the product behavior on this one. So this is from the future side. It's a plain vanilla index future. It's a future or those futures they are known, so there's nothing special, and that's also like a success factor. People really know what's going on. It's not a fancy whatever product. It's a listed future. It's on the exchange traded. You have an open uh, order book. Everything is like public. And of course, if you trade on Eurex, you have the possibility uh, of all the marching requirements with our personal marching calculators to reduce your marching costs with uh, high efficiency. So that's from the future side. It's a really easy one, and I will head over to Willem. Thank you. Thanks very much, Achim. Oh, I don't see this hot. As Achim mentioned, um, we did a market consultation across all of our clients in, in Europe in Scandinavia, in the UK, and we discussed with them this idea of applying um, standardized screens to some of our benchmarks. And within stocks, we, we've been building custom solutions that are very niche for a very long time, probably for the best part of a decade. And we wanted to bring it more towards the benchmark side, where we would incorporate ESG um, more significantly. And essentially, we found that if you look at the, the most popular ESG uh, investment criteria at the moment, you would find that um, exclusions is the most actively applied uh, investment strategy. And what we've seen and what we've learned from, from our custom days of, of building really super green uh, custom solutions for our clients is that they are usually very far removed from a benchmark. And the further you move away from the benchmark, the harder it is to get uh, uptake in the market uh, from the market participants. So we started having this discussion and we started asking our clients, if we would build an ESG, let's call it compliant benchmark, you know, what, what are the things that are the most important for you? And essentially there were a couple of messages that came back. Obviously we had to have it close to the benchmark. This is in terms of performance, in terms of risk, also in terms of uh, the number of components. We had to keep it really simple, and the simplest way that we could do it is to provide very clear uh, set of rules of what we are going to exclude, and then also by applying a free float market cap, because we can do all kinds of funny uh, weighting schemes. This was not required, and it was not asked. And then, obviously, we had to use best-in-class data providers. So at Stocks, we have an open architecture, We've been using Sustainalytics, for example, for a number of years. Uh, we're also working with CDP, ISS, uh, ESG. So we have tier one data providers that are helping us uh, with these exclusions. Then further on, the question was always, well, you, you need to make something that is really easily implementable for us. And if you can bring it in line with regulation in some other way, this would be extremely helpful uh, for our clients. And Essentially, what we try to do with the Stocks Europe 600 ESGX is to, to take our first step in terms of standardizing a certain uh, exclusion criteria. Achim has touched on some of these points before. So there were essentially three futures that were launched. One on Stocks Europe 600 ESGX. I will spend a little bit of more time on that um, in the next slide where I will walk you through how we came up uh, with the index concept and what goes on in the index concept. And then we have two further uh, indices which we've launched since years now. Stocks Europe, or Eurostox 50 Low Carbon. This was um, a foray into, into our low carbon indices as a company. Uh, we've had this index running live for, for at least four years now. 
and this is the first time where we have a, a future trying to incorporate um, climate change and trying to incorporate a low carbon solution for our, for our clients. And then the third one, Stocks Europe Climate Impact. Here we've taken a completely different view. We are looking at using forward indicators, so not backward indicators as in terms of what was the CO2 emission of the company last year, but essentially how is the company complying with TCFD, how is it complying with uh, science-based targets, and then CDP does a ranking in terms of, of where the company is in terms of its transition pathway. Now, within exclusions, uh, everybody, every client has a, a policy which is called the Responsible Investment Policy. They have certain companies that are on there which they cannot trade. And what we, again, what we've seen from our custom solutions previously is that if we have to build something for one client, we have to kick a company out of the index. For another one, this company is allowed. And what we try to do here is we try to get the greatest common denominator of what we can exclude. And I think something that the investment community is now seeing basically as business as usual is obviously the exclusions in terms of norms-based screening. So global compact screening, um, human rights, labor rights, the environment, business ethics, and anti-corruption. So this is business as usual. Everybody is now incorporating this, so this was one of the easy ones to tick. The second one that was also relatively easy to tick from a European perspective is controversial weapons. So here we are including, excluding the six or seven types of controversial weapons that everybody is now having as a basic, as a standard screen. Where it became a little bit more challenging is once we start looking from a product involvement perspective. Uh, in Europe, for four or five years now, we've had large insurance companies coming out saying that they don't want to invest in tobacco anymore. So selling healthcare products, same time investing in tobacco, these two things doesn't really fit together. And we've seen actually a large uptake in terms of a divestment out of, of tobacco. After COP21, there's been obviously this big drive in terms of getting out of thermal coal. So from, from our perspective, it was, okay, what are we going to exclude? Are we excluding the entire coal sector? Um, this is what we did in our low carbon and climate indices when we started. But here we've gone a little bit more granular. So we're looking, targeting thermal coal in, in particular. And there's two screens that we apply. One is in terms of um, extraction, thermal coal extraction and prospecting. And the second one is in terms of electricity generation uh, that is using thermal coal. And we set this both, both these screens are set at 25% um, revenue exposure. And we found that by applying these, these screens, we essentially captured this greatest common denominator of exclusionary screens that fit within the responsible investment policies of all of our clients across Europe. That then brought us to Stocks Europe 600 ESGX. We had to start somewhere. Um, as Achim mentioned, we tried to go for a broader benchmark and to see how we can apply these screens, what will come out from it, and what uh, the effect is going to be. So we start with, a, with a, the base universe, Stocks Europe 600, and then we start applying these different exclusions. Importantly, to keep it simple again, we keep it free float market cap weighted. It's very easy to implement. There's nothing difficult to understand. It's exactly like all of our other benchmarks. One part that we did bring in is something that Stocks has had within the ESG framework since day one. And this is what we call a fast exit rule. Now in practice, what does it mean? It means that when Sustainalytics raises the risk level uh, of a company to level five, we will then exclude a company from uh, our index. A practical example of this would obviously be uh, Volkswagen. When the diesel gate came around, Stocks was the first index company to exclude Volkswagen um, from our indices. So there's a very clear process around this. So once the announcement is made by Sustainalytics that the company has reached risk level five, we give the market two days notice and on the third morning the company will be excluded from the, from the index in exactly the same way as you would do any other corporate action. So this is something that we use as a, as a risk mechanism, essentially trying uh, to assist our clients when something blows up at a company, it becomes public news, that they don't have 
um, a lot of people demonstrating in front of their, of their doors and saying, why are you invested in this company? So the question has always been, when we started out with ESGX is, or with ESG, um, it used to be a question of, so how much is this EXG inclusion or exclusion, how much is it going to cost me in terms of performance? And obviously, so we apply these rules systematically. Then we had to say, okay, what, what is going to come out of this thing? So kind of hold your breath for a moment. And then we see that by applying these exclusions, we have not destroyed performance at all. So essentially, when we look at the risk and return figures over a long period of time, we see that we are this ESGX is performing in exactly the same way as what the, the benchmark is doing. So this is nice for us. This was not our primary aim to build it like that, and I create the back test that looks really nice for everybody. This is how we systematically applied the rules, and this is what we've seen over time. So essentially, if you look at the number of components, you see that we're currently standing at 577 components. So essentially, we, we're excluding 23 companies from our benchmark. But this, these 23 companies essentially are companies that are uninvestable for some of our clients. We then did a bit of a research to understand what does this exclusion mean? Does it, is it a drag in performance? Is it helping performance? Has it no impact to what is going on there? And we found that the slight outperformance that the index has has been driven mostly by the exclusions for UN Global Compact. What we are seeing is that tobacco has always been a drag. Um, everybody who has a total return fund just usually used to invest in tobacco. High dividend deal paying, very stable. And the interesting thing from the research for us is that if you look from 2016, we've actually started seeing a trend where tobacco was hurting or a drag on our performance. It is changing. It is actually now starting to slowly contribute. And I think if you look at the timelines that when the big insurers started divesting from tobacco, you will see that this more or less uh, coincides around this time. So I can think if we look at what is happening in terms of, of ESG investment in the US, for example, we see that uh, tobacco exclusion is actually one of the fastest growing exclusion criteria that is being applied. The big drag at the moment um, is coming from controversial weapons. And I think this is essentially driven if we look at the geopolitical um, situation that we have around the world at the moment, you see that there are certain militaries being built out. There's quite a lot of investment into these companies. And essentially, these companies are doing extremely well at the moment. That is why um, it, it is a drag on our index if we, uh, by excluding them. Coal didn't really have a significant uh, impact. I mean, Europe is not well known for, uh, for, for mining coal. Today we can announce that obviously we've seen the success of this product uh, and Stocks is going to roll out this ESG concept across virtually all of our benchmarks. So we will have regional benchmarks, country benchmarks, global benchmarks, um, the size and sector subsets that we have launched and essentially all our clients across the world can now participate in having these new benchmarks. So this is very exciting for us. Um, this is something that I'm sure that we will collaborate further with the colleagues from Europe, from Eurex, and see where we can launch particular um, futures on these new launches of the indices uh, that is coming out during this week. Last but not least, my disclaimer. Um, now I would like to hand over to Tobias to talk about our um, market making part of the business. Yeah. So, uh, I understand that, uh, well, just Magnus and me left between like you and lunch, and I also understand that not everybody here is in the trading industry. So I'll try to keep it really high level, try to keep it really easy. Um, if you however, do have questions, feel free to raise them during the presentation or later on. Why am I here today? Well, um, IMC, as we just saw in one of the slides, Achim pulled up, is a market maker, and we will make markets or are, doing, are making markets in these uh, newly launched futures. Um, maybe just a quick introduction for those who are not familiar with what IMC <coughs> does. We as a market maker are in the business of trading. Um, we focus mostly on the equity value chain, so we are an active market maker in equities in various derivatives such as options, futures, um, but also in the ETF space. 
Um, we do that on a global scale. We have about 600 people. We have uh, three, tra uh, three main trading hubs in Chicago, in Sydney, and in Amsterdam, where I'm based. So what I thought might be really interesting for you guys just to get a bit of better under understanding and a feeling for what the liquidity in these futures looks like is just like, let's talk about what we do, right? Like, how do we price a futures contract? We hear all day, it's super liquid, it's tradable, but what does it really mean? Like, what do we do? Where does the price that you see on your X come from? Well, it looks not really sophisticated, right? It is what you would find in the average finance textbook. The price of a futures contract is derived from the spot value plus a bit of interest rate between now and the expiration of the contract, minus a bit of dividends to be paid between now and the expiration of the contract. Doesn't sound super sophisticated yet, right? Let me, like trust me, the problem already starts at the first term, the spot price. I mean, if I ask someone in the audience what the spot price of Vodafone is, well, I guess you have an idea, right? You know what, you go to your LSE, you know what the last done was, you know what the bid is, you know what the offer is, you can sort of get a rough estimation of what the value of one share of Vodafone is. Well, for an index of 555 constituents, it's a bit different, right? Because, I mean, you don't only have to look at one Vodafone, you have to look at 577 Vodafones. And, yeah, I mean, Stocks is doing a great job calculating that index and to provide it real-time on the homepage and do it every 15 seconds, and I'm sure it's very accurate. It just doesn't help us at all. Why? Right? Because what we do is we send a trade of a price to exchange, right? A bid and an offer that you can trade on. And what happens if you trade on it? We have to hedge it. And what we need to hedge is completely different to what the computer suggests, right? So just looking at what the last done of that security was doesn't really help us in actually figuring out what it actually costs us to trade on 577 securities. So what we need to know is, what is the bid and the offer? What does the order book like, uh, look like? What does it look like on the first level? Maybe on the second level? Maybe even on the third level, it's a less liquid name. How about currencies, right? Not everything is in euros. Um, what do we do there? How, what's what's a current, uh, currency feed look like? And then even more bizarre, what do we do if you want to trade on a UK bank holiday and Germany is still open and you can, like, there has to be a price in the future? So we have to weigh to model sort of that risk to accommodate for that to make sure we can hash the position even though underlying markets might be closed. So the good news is that's our business. <laughs> so we don't have to uh, start building that from scratch just to accommodate uh, these uh, ESG futures. So we know how to do it. We have cables plugged into all the exchanges, right? We listen to the feed. We know what's coming in. We know what the last done was. We know what the order book like looks like. We know what it happens when it's updated. We have a fallback model for all these closed securities because we need it for all the ETFs that we price. And we also need it for all the other futures that we price. Right, so for us then, it is an easy way to just add an extra basket because we just look at 577 constituents, right? Um, the rest of the equation, I don't want to spend too much time on it. The interest rate, well, it's a combination of what our funding looks like and what's traded in the market uh, and the dividend yields, sort of the same, right? Uh, it's a combination of what's traded in the market. There obviously, it helps that we trade a lot of other derivatives as well that have the same exposure, the same dividend exposure. And also we have our own bottoms up valuation where we think uh, we know what the dividend should be. So I guess all that sort of gives a broad framework for how, how do we look at futures. I guess now probably interesting for you guys to know is like what does it actually mean for the ESGX futures? So what we have, stock 600 on the one side, the ESGX on the other side, 600 names, 577 names, sort of similar, right? Still market cap weighted, still the most liquid, the biggest securities making up the majority of the index, also a plus. Uh, we've seen from, uh, from, uh, from Willem just now that the performance is very similar, right? There's a high correlation, there's a high beta between the two of them, which you would expect, right? You just drop 23 names. And unless you drop like the 23 biggest names, they sort of behave similarly. Then let's talk about the differences, right? Because stock 600, it, that is a widely used benchmark, right? You trade it in your equities, there's a liquid market on close, um, it is underlying for derivatives, there's futures on it, there's options on it, there's a lot of ETFs on it. All that means, there's a lot of two-way trading happening, right? There's a natural buyer and a natural seller, they meet on exchange, right? Everybody trades in their best interest, the spreads are tight, the liquidity is there. So then we have the newly launched future. Unless you all go home now and start trading these futures, there is not natural two-way liquidity right now, right? It needs to build up. So that means, although we established that the underlying is really liquid, right? You can trade gigantic size. That's not a problem because the 577 names are the most liquid in Europe. The future, however, will probably have an order book that looks a bit slimmer and probably also like a tad wider than what you see on the stock 600. Does it mean that there's no liquidity? Of course not, right? 
But until there is enough two-way liquidity, two-way demand for buyers and sellers to come to the exchange and meet there and transfer their risk, it is up to firms like ourselves to provide a market to enable you to get in and out of these futures. Um, so I guess that's, that's the main takeaway that uh, um, I want to hear give, uh, give to you, that like, our part of the value chain is just enabling you to transfer your risk in and out of your portfolios on exchange in these new products. So I guess that's, um, that's, pretty, much, uh, that's pretty much it for me. Uh, we could talk about trading and liquidity all day, but I thought this is probably like a good entry and sort of not too heavy before lunch. Um, yeah, if there's questions now or later, anytime. Um, otherwise, I'll hand it over to Magnus, who, uh, who is uh, uh, going to share some experience from the trading side. Thank you. I need to start by thanking my colleagues here because in Amsterdam I had eight minutes, now I have 15. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my name is Magnus Linder. I'm working for Swedbank Gruber Asset Management with the derivative side of the trading. Uh, and let's see. In 2017, our new CEO more or less made a new decision that all the investments that Gruber made should be in our more or less look like the sustainable uh, rules that we have for different funds. And one of the key issues then was that um, they said you can't trade derivatives that aren't sustainable. <coughs> and I was more or less saying that, okay, I will see what's in the market. So I called three or four different salespersons at the, yeah, more or less the big banks and said to them, Please uh, take, uh, give me a list with all sustainable derivatives that I can trade because I can't trade uh, S&P, Eurostox, UMX and so on uh, in a couple of months. And it took a little bit more than a week. I didn't get the list from anyone. So I called back and said, where is my list? And they said, there aren't any product you can trade at all globally. And uh, being the one trading derivatives, it wasn't like the best day for me. So I actually went back to our CEO and said that it's, uh, or not actually the CEO, my, my boss Hans Linden said that <laughs> we have a problem. I can't trade anything for our sustainable funds. We need to change that rule. You need to go to them and tell them that uh, this is a bad rule. We can't exclude all the benchmark futures when none of the other fund companies in the world do it. So we need to make an exception. Took a couple of weeks more, nothing happened, and uh, then they told me that, uh, no, this rule will, it's more or less carved in wood or stone. It will be the truth in a couple of months. So I actually was a little bit afraid of what, what will happen with my job. So I called uh, CME, I talked to uh, Eurex as well, not that guy actually, <laughs> uh, pity that time actually, and uh, talked to NASDAQ as well and said that I need to have a sustainable product that I could trade, listed, and I want it more or less next quarter. Um, and we had many, many discussions. We started quite um, actively with, with NASDAQ in the beginning, and uh, because it is, it's our home market, and uh, being the biggest player in, in the Nordic market made it quite easy to have them listen to us. So <coughs> after, I would say a little bit more than a year, they launched the product. And um, during this whole journey, I, in the beginning, realized that there were so many questions from the exchange, from the index provider, that I couldn't like explain or didn't have an opinion about. So I needed some friends internally. So I actually went over to Christine Wallander, who was in the audience before here, um, because as if you're sitting in the front and more or less just taking care of the flows, um, you're not so familiar with should we have like exclusions, should it be uh, best leaders and so on. And um, so I needed, I needed some really intelligence. Uh, and Christine was my main speaking partner in that. So I took her to every meeting. And um, I would say that for me, when I'm looking back 
uh, especially with the NASDAQ case, I would say that if I would have tried to do this on my own, I wouldn't have succeeded. But um, taking Christine with me and meeting different uh, market makers, other buy sites in Stockholm and so on, made this journey really fun. And I had lots of contacts after that uh, that I more or less didn't know were in the industry. Uh, so it, I can say that it was, yeah, it was a really fun trip. And let's see, da, 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 da. Um, after the NASDAQ launch, we, or actually in the middle of the NASDAQ process, we contacted uh, Eurex again. Um, and in this case, it was Ashim that we met. And we had more or less the same discussions, like how do we want the index to be? Um, what kind of criteria should you use and so on? And I think that our main view on this was we want an ESG product. We want it to be, of course, sustainable. It must be some kind of like base level, but we want it to have market acceptance. I mean, we don't want to have like an ESG Ruber product uh, because if nobody else trade it, it's more or less useful, useless. We can trade any like, um, I mean, if you go to a bank and say, this is the basket I want to trade, they will make the product for you. But we wanted to have a liquid listed future. So in that case, you need market acceptance and you need everybody on board, actually. So if we look at those two products, I mean, first was NASDAQ, Omex ESG. We were first, we'll say three months, we were 100% of the volume or 99, 98 or something. And uh, now we're down to about 50%. But I mean, it's still, we're still too, too big in that uh, market. If you look at that compared to, to stock 600 ESGX, uh, we were more or less the day one and two, close to 100. I mean, we weren't 100, but close to 100%. But just three days later, we dropped to like, 70 and then it was 80 and I would say less than a month we were only 50% and now we are down to like 15% or something. So you can see that the Eurex product was really, really accepted by the rest of the market. And the best way of measuring it is of course that the spread is getting tighter. And if you look at the, the normal benchmark against the ESG, you can see that it's a wider spread in the ESG, but when we want to trade, we, of course, we're going to call three or four different um, uh, banks and they will give us a, a basis quotes. And the basis trades that we do in ESG is really, really tight. Not as tight as, uh, as the normal benchmark, but really, really tight. And to be honest, to, if you have a screen fund, you can't actually look at the normal benchmark, I think. I mean, if you're not allowed to own tobacco or weapons, you should compare what is the price to trade the basket against trading the future. So that is actually our main goal for both of this, these products, to have the cheapest and best way of having the ESG exposure. And the, the, the main problem for all funds is that you want to be fully invested, and of course you need cash to handle in and outflows. That's a problem for all funds. And there are three ways to do that. You can, um, of course, be ESG and underinvested. That uh, means that you're buying stocks for like uh, equities for 96, 95, 98 percent or something, and have two, three, or five percent in, in cash on the account to handle in and outflows. Of course, if you're under investment and, and the funds is going up or benchmark is going up, you will lose money. The other way, and I would say the most common way, is um, to be fully invested and um, almost ESG. But if you go to the marketing department and say, now we will launch a new fund, it's called almost ESG. <laughs> it will be quite hard to sell that one. So, the normal way is to have the basket, I mean the normal stocks in the portfolio, and then they use five, six, or up to 
on index benchmark futures, but the problem is that that product is more or less polluted or not according to the regulation that the funds had. And the last one, and that one that we aimed for, was to have an ESG future. So now, quite many of our funds has ESG, they're fully invested, and, sorry, and fully invested. So they have the normal uh, basket, ESG screen and everything, and then on top of that we have the ESG futures uh, with different kind of percentage, of course. And um, that makes us, for those funds, actually the, the we can meet the clients and say, if you buy our funds, it will be fully investment, invested and it will be fully ESG. And I think that's quite unique, actually. And I know that that won't work forever. Um, the rest of you and the rest of the <coughs> Swedish uh, fund companies will soon go the same way. Uh, we saw earlier, do you think that ESG will be the new benchmark? And it was 57% or something that said yes. And I would say, uh, think it will be. Not maybe like in two years or four years or five years, but <coughs> within five to ten years, I think the, the new benchmark on every country would be ESG. Maybe not on a top level, but on some base level. When I had my um, meeting with the, the different uh, asset owners within Ruber and with my boss Hans I, and tried to convince them to, to use future. It was not in that case actually the ESG, just the normal benchmark. I made some calculations. I took our um, index, European index fund and our Swedish index funds and I took all the data from it and so how many rebalancing, do we, how big is the daily rebalancing for these two funds? And um, what is the cost of that? Because when, when I'm from the derivative side, it said that we can't stop trade f futures because it would be too expensive to trade the baskets. Nobody actually listened to me because they said, that, of course, Magnus think it's better to trade derivatives than trade the, the underlying stock. So I realized that I needed to have some hardcore figures. So I compared the cost, and if you look at the um, stocks 50, and this is of course for us, I mean, I think you should actually do this exercise back in your company. You will be probably quite shocked about the figures, but uh, this is, might give you like an indication. Um, so if you look at trading uh, the basket for stocks 50, it's going to cost us on a daily base 470 euros. And to trade the same volume in the stocks 50, will cost us eight. So quite big difference on a daily basis. And if you do that 250 days, it will be 115,000 euro that we will use, lose just using the basket against the future. So 59 times more expensive. If you take the next one, the stock 600, um, and make the same comparison, you see that uh, to trade the futures, uh, would cost us about 14 euros um, <laughs> and 5,600 euros to trade the basket. And by now, someone should say, but hello, you need to optimize. <laughs> and of course, you need to optimize. So if you optimize and just trade 150 companies out of the 600, if you have the basket, it will go from 5,500 to 1,386 euros. But still it's going to be uh, six times, oh sorry, uh, 100 times more expensive to trade the basket. And if you're doing a really good job and making the op optimization down to 50 companies, it will drop to 456, of course the same as stocks uh, 50. And that is equal to 34 times more expensive in, in, in this case. So um, to trade just one stock for us on a European base, in average cost us nine euros. So if I would rebalancing more than two stocks in, in this case, it will actually be cheaper to buy the future than just rebalancing on a daily basis two out of the 600 companies. And you can't rebalancing 
two by two by two by two. It will have a huge uh, effect on the um, tracking error over time. And we did the same calculation, of course, for, for UMX. And in that case, it's 3.6 times more expensive to, to trade uh, the basket. And I knew, I mean, that my whole career was working as a market maker at the exchange with, with clearing and so on. I knew that it was a, a big difference, but I mean, I didn't know that it would be 59 times or 100 times and so on. I mean, I think this is something that all of you should like go back and say, what, what is all the cost? Uh, because mainly the, the biggest part of this is um, cost from the operational side when you trade big baskets. I mean, if you're a trader in the front and you, t for us to trade one company or 600 companies or 1,200 companies, it's more or less the same. You just put it in the system, send it DMA, get the fields, and book it down to the operation. But on the operational part, when you're booking down 600 companies or 400 companies, it will have a huge um, cost impact for the fund. And of course, the, those uh, costs are taken from the fund on owners. So what did I achieve beside having the, the UMX and was a part of, of the UREX uh, side? I think that what me and Christine actually did was for the first time in many years, I mean, I worked in NASDAQ myself 10 years ago, and <coughs> what we did is we took new products to the market and we hoped that the sell side and, and uh, the buy side would use the product, but I think this is one of the first times ever when actually the investors went to the fund companies and told them we want to have sustainable funds. The funds went to the exchange and to the sell side and say, we need you to provide us with products that we can use in order to be sustainable. So I think it's easier as a buy side today to actually have an opinion and have an influence in what the next generation or next products that the exchange will do. I think if, if you call Ashim or, or Stocks and so on and say that this is how we want it to be. This is our view and this is the way we think uh, the market is moving. I think they will actually be a really good li listener to, to what you have to say. And. Um, <coughs> For me, I can say that uh, after this launch, I mean, I'm more or less every derivative newspaper in the world called me, like I said, ah, how did you do and what did you do and how did you achieve it? And I would say, the problem is I got quite much glory for the work that Christine and everybody else did. I just wanted to keep my job and I succeeded with that. <laughs> Thank you. All right, uh, I'm on again. Thank you very much uh, to our panelists, uh, Tobias Zach and Willem Magnus. Uh, there's a couple of questions actually that came up. Um, we'll try to address them quickly because people want to actually have lunch, I guess. Um, but, and, and I saw you, don't worry. Uh, from, the, uh, from the app, would ESGX also work on US 500? Yes. Short answer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a hungry man, right? Um, yes. And it's going to come, right? Uh, it should be there by Thursday. Fantastic. <laughs> so do you believe all benchmarks in the future will include ESGS exclusion criteria? That's another one for you. Uh, again, short answer, yes. I would say that I think, as I mentioned, this is a path that we are starting to travel along. This was our first step that we've taken. Uh, this is clearly not the last step. We will keep on integrating ESG further. I think this is a very exciting space. I think it will change over time, but you have to start with a base, and I think this base from an exclusion perspective is set now, um, and from here on, we can really start building new and innovative solutions. Watch this space. Great. Thank you. Please. Hi. Um, um, I get that this is very equities focused, but if I'm, you know, a traditional asset manager has got thousands, 
tens of thousands of products that they can use to manage all of the risks across the portfolio. Where do we go with the broader derivatives discussion as to exchanges launching new products? So, you know, have your discussions around the equity space led to discussion about, about the underlying, so commodities, fixed income? What, what are you looking at in terms of those sorts of things? And what questions are coming up for you as to about the hedgeability and, and the risk management of those risks? Yeah, we are looking at that. So that, that's a major, major uh, impact. I mean, just an example given, like if, if you take into account that, uh, as example, uh, Australia is now developing a lot of like uh, coal production and coal uh, heating and coal uh, energized uh, producing uh, uh, plants now, uh, you could like uh, do an, an ESG uh, compliant bond or something that actually then drives them into uh, the space where if they do so, like behave with this one, uh, they will have like the punishment in terms of the interest rate, in terms of the, the, the product. So there, there is a discussion going on also like in the bond market and, and all over the space. So it's like it's a discussion we are doing and uh, I feel happy if you, if you have ideas, if you want to um, give us a point. So this is what we do. This was what Magnus mentioned, so it was very uh, successful cooperation, like uh, going exactly to the firms and talk to the buy side clients. What is the demand? What are you looking for? What kind of criteria do you have? Uh, to come up with like uh, such a successful product, uh, which uh, was then made by Willem. So this is was uh, what we, we saw, what works out very well, and uh, that's what we therefore from the exchange side. So it's Nico from Stocks and me from Eurex um, dealing with the clients. And uh, of course, uh, if if there's demand, uh, we will figure out a product which uh, will fit the market. And of course, then liquidity is a key factor for success. We will talk to the market makers. We will talk to the market. We will look, act like a responsible on like sustainability and, um, of course, um, yeah, what will function and what we'll see, um, that what we saw like in the open interest and uh, to come up with uh, products for the future which are like more driven towards ESG, like in all spectrum. I guess maybe one point to add to this is, uh, like from a liquidity providing perspective, there's no limitation to this, right? I mean, you can bundle whatever you like in a basket and make a product out of it. If you look at the ETF space, there's like thousands of different combinations of baskets all have this like sort of slightly unique flavor to it. What people should be aware of, though, is as long as there's actually people using it, right? Like, natural buyers and sellers coming to the place and exchange their risk, it will be a quote driven market where you rely on the existence of market makers. All right, so it will always be a bit more expensive than, you know, if you just exchange your risk to someone else who really wants it. Um, so I guess, like, we can do everything, right? Just, you know, let us know what the product specifications are. But I guess then you have to be careful about that you don't end up having, like, this massive range and this, like, huge tail of products that exist, but you know, like, no one really uses them. So I guess like, the ESGX, for instance, is a great example, right? It is sort of, it is specialized enough to give people comfort who want to have the product, an ESG compliant one, but it's also broad enough to still be liquid and, you know, appeal to a wider audience. So I guess that's why probably the, the success of this in the first few weeks has been so good.